but um, well, good morning, all. Thanks for joining us for our latest in our webinar series from Hydroterra. Uh, I'll give uh, people one more minute to come on board and then we'll get into proceedings. A few people now who have logged in. So uh, let's get underway. So what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about continuous ground gas monitoring and how to reduce the uncertainty of measurements and risk assessments associated with that continuous monitoring, but also just with ground gas measurement in general. Um, this is something that's close to my heart, um, having dealt a lot with ground gas over the years and uh, felt the need to reach out to the experts in ground gas solutions who are based in the UK because they have um, a few more years on us in terms of the evolution of ground gas and how it's used. It's not to say we don't have a lot, a lot of knowledge here, but I do think it's always worth having a look at uh, how others are doing these things. So we've struck up a bit of a relationship with ground gas solutions. I will. So who we got presenting today? Well, I'm the managing director of Hydroterra. Michelle's in the background, keeping us on track with this. And John Naylor is joining us from the UK. And thanks very much, John, for staying up late tonight to provide this presentation. So John has extensive experience in ground gas and the analysis of that data, but also in the manufacture of instrumentation associated with the continuous ground gas monitoring. Before we get uh, too far into the detail, just if you would like to raise a question and please do uh, throughout these presentations, it's great to get feedback and that's, uh, that's a big part of why we run these things. Um, there's a Q&A button that you push and you can type your questions into that. At the end of the presentation, we will uh, run through those questions. And if we can't answer them, we will get back to you with an answer uh, after the session. I'm sure we'll be able to answer most of them. Why does Hydroterra run this webinar series? Well, we like to encourage the adoption of new monitoring technologies. That's what we specialize in. We like to assist in training in these technologies and these webinars are all about training. But we also like to get more clarity of the challenges that industry are facing so we can look for the technologies to help with those challenges. So what's going on today? Well, we'll start with what we've just done, a presentation and uh, how you can raise questions. Uh, then we move to John, who will be talking uh, from ground gas solutions about reduced uncertainty through continuous ground gas monitoring. And then I will talk about the continuous ground gas monitoring options that Hydroterra has for you in Australia. Um, and then we will shift to the Q&A session. So who are ground gas solutions? Well, they're a leading company out of the UK who specialise pretty much solely in ground gas monitoring. Um, it would be hard in Australia to run a business just focused on ground gas monitoring. The UK market is bigger and uh, for that reason it's been able to produce some very specialised expertise. Uh, so they provide consultancy around ground gas monitoring. They provide continuous ground gas monitoring services. They also provide services actually monitoring the receptors. Uh, where you might have uh, ground gas exposure. Um, 
They do a lot with landfills. They have a lot of expertise assisting with risk assessments and they have developed some of their own continuous ground gas monitoring technologies. Um, so our relationship with ground gas solutions is we've formed an agreement to collaborate with them really to support the consultancy industry sector with uh, further knowledge that they have to bring to the table around data analytics, around the continuous monitoring, as well as to partner on their technology, which is called Sentinel, which is another continuous gas monitoring system. So I'm gonna hand over to John Naylor now to introduce himself and run through that presentation. Over to you, John. All right, well, thank you, Richard. And I'll just uh, share my screen now. Um, but good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me all nice and clear from the, the other side of the world, as I say. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about continuous monitoring and ground gas in general, and how we actually improve our data so we can get better risk assessments from it. Uh, just a little bit of background about um, for myself. Um, so I've probably been in the business now, or at least as a, as a, as a consultant for a, a good 20 years. Um, within that period of time, um, I've been a regulator. Um, I've been a, a construction quality assurance engineer on landfills. I've been a, a consultant on the, uh, on the coal face. Um, out uh, supervising, monitoring well, construction, borehole, logging, that kind of stuff, trial pitting. Did a lot of monitoring in the early days. I've still done a lot of monitoring these days. Um, and then I got more and more into the, the consultancy side, the risk assessment side, as well as developing new kits and new ways and new analysis techniques um, to, to try and aid our understanding of ground gas and how we, we manage those risks. So in the next sort of 30 to 40 minutes, um, I'm gonna go through why, we, why we're worried and what influences we have uh, with respect to ground gas monitoring data and why it's important to think about those influences when we're actually doing our assessments. And by doing that, we build our confidence in the data. And I'm gonna go through a series of, of different tools and techniques which you can consider that might help you you know, improve your confidence as well as develop your conceptual site models on sites. I'm then going to kind of talk about boundary monitoring, which can be quite useful for those that are looking at more uh, sites where they're worried about liabilities or of existing um, assets, or there's potentially new uh, waste disposal facilities going in, and you want to understand what the background concentrations are in the ground. So you can use those results to then forward plan monitoring and, and compliance. And then finally look at the, the sort of next generation of continuous monitoring. So what are these ground gas hazards? Well, I'm just gonna bring a free case studies really that would have brought it to the front. Um, and it started, in fact, it started in the UK uh, many, many decades ago, a, a lot associated with, it, with the coal mining industry. But on the surface, when it came to sort of development and, and certainly with the residential setting, um, the case that really kick-started um, serious investigation and management of ground gas was, was an incident in Lasco back in 1986, um, where you can just see the photograph there. That was a, was a residential bungalow that got reduced to a, a pile of rubble and some matchsticks. Now, thankfully, nobody was, was killed within that, that, um, that incident, um, but it, it did, um, at the time, create a public inquiry as to why that happened, and the findings of, the, of that inquiry came out that we had migration of, of landfill gas um, to the property, and through the, the public inquiry, it brought out what, what is the source pathway receptor model that we use you know, the conceptual model that we use so much these days within contaminated land risk assessment. And it also brought out the driving mechanisms for, for ground gas within those assessments. And in LOSCO, uh, the key driver there was, was atmospheric pressure changes as well. We, we were definitely touching that through the presentation. Uh, one nearer to home, you guys, would be the Cranbourne. 
um, incident over in Melbourne back in 2010. So it's again, 10 years on now, a decade on. And here, um, a similar thing to, in, in many regards, we had a, a landfill, a waste depository that was migrating and lost control of gas that was migrating. I think it was several hundred meters through igneous rocks and fractures within igneous rocks in there. And of course, where we've got the infrastructure to these, these sites and as cities expand, this land is easily accessible, easily becomes more valuable. And of course, it gets built upon because the highways are already in of landfills. Um, and unfortunately, in, in the Cambon case, the, the gas was, was migrating and a lot of work had to be done there to make sure that that was managed and made safe. Um, but we still haven't learned all our lessons over in Mumbai either. We had a, a more recent one in 2013, at this time, Gorebridge in Scotland. Uh, here, this wasn't actually landfill gas. This one was associated with shallow historical coal mining and workings. And here, you can see those houses um, in the photograph, they're boarded up. They were actually affected by CO2, so carbon dioxide coming out of, of the ground. Um, and then, again, um, evidence from various reports uh, into the garbage has identified a number of factors that could have basically uh, assisted in, in those ground gas pathways and soft pathway receptor being uh, linkage being made. And unfortunately, in that case, um, several uh, people were admitted to A and E uh, for carbon dioxide poisoning. Thankfully, nobody again died in this. But as a, a direct result of those incidents, the local authority involved um, decided to basically vacate 64 houses and demolish them. So the actual, you know, the outcomes of, the, of, of not getting it right are actually quite significant. Um, but do bear in mind as well that these cases are still quite rare. So they're, they're not an everyday occurrence, thankfully. But we do need to manage things better so we hopefully don't get any more of these as we go forwards. So what actually influences our ground gas monitoring data? So if we take a quick look at a standard way of, of monitoring, and here we've got our monitoring well, our borehole with our monitoring well in there, you can see the, the various uh, detections there. So we have let me see our pointer, we have a, a standpipe in here, which some point we have a response zone. And the slotted pipe bit, a tap at the top with some kind of bung and some kind of cover. But my message uh, to you guys is that these monitoring wells, these boreholes, treat them as unique scientific instruments. You know, each one has its own unique uh, characteriz characteristics that really you can need to look at and understand in detail when you're doing risk assessments. As far as ground gas is concerned, and what are the, the main factors? Well, geology obviously has a major part. Permeability is within. You know, are you actually in a location where the gas is being generated? Or are you actually somewhere away from there where gas may be accumulating from that source and is just being stored within the permeable strata underneath? What's groundwater doing? You know, where does that sit in relation to your response zone? And the geology and the permeability of the different soils. And we'll see through later slides how, how big an influence groundwater can have. Weather conditions, as we saw with the LOSCO incident earlier, play a key role as well. And don't forget, also, as gases do move through the ground as, a, as they migrate, we do see gas modification. So that could be logical effects, chemical effects, physical effects as the gas moves through the soil. Okay. The data that we get out of there really comes from the response zone and, and shouldn't really come from anywhere else if it's a well installed well. So again, you know, think about the data in terms of, of where that response zone sits. Okay, and then quite importantly is make sure that we have a good seal at the top because we do see a lot of installation wells in the UK where we're seeing atmospheric air index into the which you know, for one, actually does reduce your confidence then in, in the data set you're getting as, as being all representative or worst case of, of ground gas conditions. Don't forget as well as we're drilling these 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 monitoring locations that 
a lot of information is obtained from soil sampling and descriptions. In the UK, we use the British standards there uh, to do that. But while we're doing that, why not get some extra information? You know, take some gas readings while you're actually advancing the way, so you get a feel for where uh, maybe you've got your more saucy or gassy pathways within that well. You know, and that could be used then to maybe, you know, more appropriate uh, select your uh, your response on your screening horizon within that. Okay, and again. Remember that seal is really important. And just to, to hammer that home, uh, this is one of probably the worst examples that we've come across in the UK, um, but somebody was actually monitoring this well for 12 months before we got called in to figure out why they weren't finding any gas in the landfill. It's fairly evident. It's been done. And unfortunately, in this case, there was no supervision of the driller. So they did what they get somebody on what's going on and make sure that that data is, is captured there. It's very valuable stuff. So once we've got our, our monitoring goals, what do we do? How do we get confidence in our monitoring data? <clears throat> so first of all, what do we mean by confidence? Well, I suppose another word for it is uncertainty. Um, and there's, a, there's a, an IPPC uh, document that talks all about uncertainty and it's quite useful. Uh, and can be applied to various areas of science, including uh, our, our sector two and ground gases. So here, what we want to try and move from is from a, basically a, a period where we, we might have low confidence. So we've got low agreement with our conceptual model, whatever it is that's developed and very little evidence to go off. So the other end of the spectrum where we have high agreement with our conceptual model and robust evidence that matches that as well. So obviously, as that increases, confidence goes up. So we look at that from a case of spatial, uh, uh, putting in boreholes on, on, a, on a plan. Let's take this example of a housing estate. Should we just put a handful of, of monitoring locations at this site, at this size, our actual confidence within the data that we obtain from there might be relatively low, although the data from individual wells could be great actual confidence in the overall setting be relatively low. So of course, the more we increase the density of monitoring locations, the higher that confidence will be as we go along. And it's not until we actually get quite a decent coverage where we, we get much better confidence and that robust evidence we need in some cases uh, for our conceptual models and risk management tools. Okay. But we can also have when we doing ground gas monitoring, high variability, just in the, in the, you know, the spatial uh, locations of ground gas. So I, I use this example here, which is where we've done surface emission survey, and then we've modeled the sort of relative flux from the, locate, from the various points across the surface. And you can see just through this information here, that the sort of colored areas, and particularly the red areas are higher concentrations of in this case, methane. Uh, coming out of the ground. This is an old landfill um, here. And you can see that it's not everywhere. So where you put your monitoring wells might have a big influence on what kind of data you receive from, from, from that monitoring. So again, be aware that it's high, highly variability in spatial um, as well. But to add to that, not only have we got the spatial uh, differences, we have the sort of temporal differences too. So every time we go out and do monitoring, so most people do periodic monitoring, um, you will find differences in each of those boreholes. Okay, so here we've just got some records here, and if we just look at the carbon dioxide results, we can see quite variable results across that one site there. Okay, we do several of these to build up a better picture. You know, if we did periodic monitoring in, in a different way, here's a here's an example where we actually do. Basically, we sample over several uh, minutes um, and it, every so often, so every 30 to 60 seconds, we actually record the values at that time. You can even see changes in that data too. Now, I've selected this well because it's fairly stable with the with foot gases, so methane, CO2, and oxygen pretty much stabilize quickly. And you'll notice there that the methane is actually really high. So anybody that sees that kind of 
of methane, we'll start to get ideas as to okay, what's going on here. And another clue is actually if we look in the gas flow, that when we initially start to do the monitoring of the gas flow, we, we actually do have a positive flow of, of, of over nine litres an hour there. But we can see as the minutes pass that that actually drops down to actually no flow at all. Okay, so some of you will be looking at that and thinking, I know what that is. Um, we'll, we'll probably find a few examples as we go through the presentation just to give you a clue what it is. Further, just to elaborate the point of, of temporal differences in, in monitoring, I'm going to show some, some differences between periodic monitoring and continuous monitoring. So here I'm just going to consider methane, and I'm going to send a site operative out to take three weekly samples at a borehole. doesn't matter which borehole we're just going to put. And that operative comes back and tells me that there's, there's no methane. I then send another operative out a couple of days after the first operative um, with the same instrument. Okay, and they came back with this picture. So at this time, they've actually found methane, but every subsequent visit, it's diminished off. So your interpretation of that might be, well, it might be just a sap pocket of methane, and every time we go with depleting that and carry on, I will find it's gone even further and maybe nothing to worry about. But let's send somebody else out just a couple of days later. Same instrument, same location, and they get this picture, your old monitoring. Now here, we've got an increasing concentration of meat. So what does that mean? Now, all of these data points are all valid. They've all been taken in line in, you know, in lines with the set procedures with calibrated instrumentation. So which data set's right? And in reality, at this particular location, through continuous monitoring, you can see that they are all, all right. But the gas concentrations are so variable, and it's really hard to pick up a picture as to what's going on to the behavior. So why do we see these things? Okay. Well, a lot of the time, it's down to environmental correlations. Okay, And we, we monitor the ground gases with gases of interest, along with some environmental key environmental parameters to tease out these relationships and see what's actually driving ground gas movement or behavior. So what are these? Well, there's several of them, but the, the principal ones are pressure, temperature to a lesser extent, and actually groundwater is changing. Water is, is quite a key driver too. Okay, now by monitoring these variables along with the ground is we can try to show correlations with gas concentration changes or indeed actually eliminate those correlations where we don't see those problems interacting. Another way that we can use environmental correlations is to try and work out how long a period of monitoring you know, would be useful to, uh, to satisfy what we call in the UK and current guidance as worst case conditions. Um, so in, in, in a lot of guidance in the Okay, worst case conditions is, is taken as, as falling atmospheric pressure. Okay, so how often does that happen? And how often are you likely to capture that with your monitoring? Well, what we can do is we can take some pressure data, and here we've got uh, some, some data from Manchester for two years from the, from the Met Office station, and we can actually statistically break this data down. So within, within that data set, there, I could tell you there's there's over 130, well, there's 130 falls greater than eight millibars within there. And if we take that data and plot it as a scatter plot, the pressure fall duration versus the actual size of it. Okay, put some statistics up there. So there's our 138. We can see actually the 75th percentile of this data, a pressure fall of 19 millibars is experienced. Okay, but also what's important about pressure falls is the rate of they, they happen too. And in here, the biggest one we've got is 2.6 millibars an hour. So we'll put a line in there for the 8 millibars. We're going to ignore everything below that. Now we've got some older guidance that gives us some indications of, of, of what they considered significant. So British coal, they decided that a 4 millibar fall over three hours was very significant. 
and indeed it is. So we can draw that line on that scatter graph as well. And then we might consider the 75th percentile line as being significant for our needs and purposes. And we put another line there. And then we might also consider that longer rates of fall at one millimeter are all considered significant. And then we can start to shade that area as what we can call our worst case zone. Pressure just low. Um, and you could do this down in Victoria, wherever we are, we can take that data and work out what would be considered worst case from a pressure flow scenario. And indeed, if we map Losco on there, you can see when that happened was was right in that worst case zone as well. But what we're essentially saying from this, this sort of quick analysis is that we tend to see a, a 19 millibar fall three weeks. So pretty much in the, at least in the UK around Manchester, if we did a four week period of continuous monitoring, we're quite likely to find within that data a significant pressure. Therefore our data meet those conditions. So let me introduce you to time series data. So this is kind of the output that we collect from our continuous monitoring equipment. So on the current graph, we've got atmospheric pressure and borehole static pressure on the top graph. We've got the bulk gases in the middle, with methane, CO2, oxygen. And then the lower graph, we've got groundwater. So again, we're trying to correlate, correlate the different gases what with the environmental behaviors of pressure, based on atmospheric pressure, and water level. And as you can see, every time we get a deep um, pressure fall in these instances, we get a response in this case, in this location, in Lethal. Okay, so trying to replicate that with periodic monitoring and get the same picture, so get the same confidence is going to be really bad. Okay, but with continuous monitoring within that four week period or three week period here, we're collecting maybe 600 data points. Um, you know, it's a lot more information for which you can then look at and understand what's going on. Let's take another example. Here, yeah, so if you look at the photograph, we have um, obviously some boats in the background. We're actually at some docks. Okay, uh, we're doing some monitoring in some some silts, dock silts, uh, for a new development that's going on there, and we're in a tidally influenced uh, location. So, a conceptual model would expect to see um, tidal influence of ground gas data. So how do we collect that evidence? Well, we could go out and do periodic monitoring, but let's overlay the continuous data okay, with water level. And you can just see you know, without a shadow of a doubt, the evidence is there, continuous monitoring, without doing any further analysis. But that is what's driving at least movement of the ground. It's some really powerful stuff. There's lots of other analysis tools, and I've just got a few on the screen here. Um, there's lots more besides, but I just thought I'd, I'd demonstrate some of these to you. Um, I quite like the top left graph because this is the archetypal, um, let's go out and monitor when atmospheric pressure is falling. But the take home point here is actually as atmospheric pressure falls, we could do our spot monitoring at any point along the blue line, the atmospheric pressure line, and, and apparently match or you know keep with our worst case conditions. But if you actually look what happens with the red line, the methane, that goes up and up and up and up and up until we get to the trough of the fall before we actually get our true conditions. So when you're doing your spot monitoring, always try to get out there basically when the weather is bad. Okay, that's when you're going to see the worst gas coming out of the ground. It's usually pressure and ice rainfall and so, on and so forth. We can also look at time series uh, graphs or actually take a time series graph and break that up. If we suspect that there's some kind of pattern to the data um, within there that doesn't correlate maybe with atmospheric pressure or things, it might be associated with the time of day. And indeed, in, that, in the top middle graph there, we can see uh, we've lost our time zone. But this is the middle of the night up here. We can actually see through the day, the gas concentrations or the VOC concentrations drop, and then overnight they build back up again and they drop again through the day. So depending on where that monitoring has been conducted, that might tell you 
a lot of information as to why that's happening and actually then going further into the screen from there. There's other uh, methods as well. So in the bottom left, we've got purge and recovery tests where we basically empty the well of, of existing gases with an inert gas. We monitor the recovery of those gases to see how well, how quickly those come back in. That's a useful test in, in certain circumstances, but it's not great everywhere. So the application of that has to be considered. Uh, we can do concentration duration curves, which is the lower one in the middle there, where we're actually taking the time series data and we're just expressing that as a percentage of which a concentration is, is exceeded. Okay, and we can split this up into the different classes. So what does this tell us? Well, it can give us some indication of, 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 of where we might be, for instance, within a migration. So in this example on the screen, we're about 50-50. So we're right in the smack in the middle of the migration location. Well, if it was more towards the source, we'd see more of the percentage. So it, it would extend to the right, and if we're further away, it would be more to the left. And then the last one there is actually looking at dissolved gases in groundwater as well, but by using headspace testing as well. So let's have a little look at that one. So what we've done here is we've actually modeled um, using the diffusive uh, fixed law of, of ground gas coming on methane, in this case, coming out of the uh, solution um, from groundwater. And then what we've done is we've, we've actually in a purge and recovery test on as well, how we've monitored the methane coming back into the headspace and correlation between our model parameter versus our reality is, is, is stunning, really. Um, and again, you know, fantastic evidence of high confidence that the methane that's appearing in the well um, is actually dissolved within the ground. So of course, there are other ways of testing this and showing this, but this is, again, another line of evidence doing so. Okay. Again, this is at standard pressure and temperatures. If you've got a deeper source, pressurized sources, you know, be careful about your models because it will throw them out. It won't be the same. Just to give you an indication, with methane, you can maybe get 25 milligrams per liter saturation at normal temperatures and pressure. So we only need about, you know, just over one and a half, one and a half milligrams to give us 5% more volume in a headspace. So not very much. So you can see. With not much gas in the in the water, we can get quite high percentages, 95 percent up in the in the headspace. Which remember the spot monitoring before. There is okay. some other key parameters um, that we use with, with continuous monitoring as well as periodic monitoring, as well as the measurement of pressure, and it's really important from some practice. Um, now in the UK, practice has been is to between monitoring is to keep the gas wells closed so the taps closed so we're trapping in whatever the gases are within the well okay so there's different ways of measuring pressure so this is the way um, that gas clamp principally does it um, and this uses a static pressure assessment essentially it takes a, a pressure within the standpipe um, and it takes pressure within the atmosphere, okay, so absolute pressure sensors on our end, okay, they're not interlinked. And what you tend to see, so here's our atmospheric pressure base there, okay. Now, if I put the, what's actually in the monitoring well underneath there, you will see that they follow each other, but you'll notice that the actual borehole pressure, the purple line, lags behind slightly. Okay. So it lags as the difference between the atmospheric pressure. Okay, and you'll also know it's not as, as great a difference as the atmospheric pressure as well. So we get that generally, usually, typically because of the permeability contrast between the air and the soils underneath and where our response zone sits. But you said effectively the difference between those two, okay, is known as our differential pressure, okay, on the, on the lower graph there. And what you will find when you're doing your periodic monitoring with your flow instrument is that when atmospheric pressure is a is uh, below that of the atmosphere of the borehole pressure, as we've got here, you get a positive flow rate. Okay. And when we go and do the reverse, so atmospheric pressure is above that of the monitoring well, we get a negative flow rate. So you dynamic bit there. And when both are equal, we don't see any flow. 
Okay. So a lot of you that are out there doing periodic monitoring, hopefully this gives you some, some ideas as to what might be going on with your results. And particularly you'll see this where you open up a tap to your flow monitoring, it might be quite high initially. Okay, and then over a period of, of minutes, it drops down to nothing. All essentially you're doing is just equalizing the pressure between the monitoring events so, so it's basically equal with, with atmosphere. Um, and that's what we saw in that first monitoring, uh, period monitoring results earlier in, in the slide set. So a really useful way of thinking about the monitoring. term that's, that's applied to this kind of uh, process is barometric pumping. Okay. Now, obviously, if you were in a landfill or a gener active generator source, you wouldn't tend to see this. You would just basically see that the ball pressure is always above that atmospheric pressure that have very little influence within there. The other way is, is dynamic pressure measurement. So this is what you're doing when you're doing spot monitoring, you're taking your flow measurements. Okay, and that started to appear in continuous monitoring instruments, including our gas sensor. So here's some data off our gas sensor. So at the top graph, we've got static results. So you can see there that the atmospheric pressure ball pressures is very similar. There are slight differences in the bar or two out. The middle graph is our time series data for methane, CO2, and oxygen. And then the lower graph is actually our flow rate. So by dynamic pressure, what we basically do is we're opening up well within the instrument that allows either gas to escape from the borehole through the monitoring instrument to air, or air to actually come into the instrument and go back into the monitoring well. So that's your positive and negative flow rates. Okay. So obviously, if we're doing that in a continuous mode, or at least here with an hourly mode, that well is being opened up an hour or whatever you set it to. So again, when we think about our periodic monitoring, and continuous monitoring, we've got to be mindful of that flow rate is most likely to be lower than we would see in a, in a, in a traditional periodic monitoring. So, so because of that, that has been open so much more frequently and the monitoring was getting time to equalize when we're doing that. Okay, so two important points there as well. Another way we can look at things is to use ternary events. Um, so here we've got, we basically use the sort of methane, the bulk gases, methane, CO2, and oxygen as the end members, but against the ratio of nitrogen. And if we take, um, well, all three of these plots show landfill gas migration at, at the monitoring point locations. Um, as you can see here, we've got the 60, 40% sort of ratio of methane to CO2, quite neat, new landfill gas, and then over here we've got more or less like this very air at this location. And then in between, we have the migration effect of gas coming through as well. It's quite strong there as well. What we do also see here as well, we're getting a bit more CO2 scatter with, with, with these wells, which could also and does also actually indicate that we see an oxidation going on uh, within this, uh, this sort of pathway too. So lots more information to get from your continuous data. Okay, so let's have a look at, at what compositions that, that might, what that might do to gas composition of the ground. So if you just take the example that we've got with the diagram from the top right there, we have our source of gas, and let's say that's migrating through some, some permeable layer, and let's say we've got methane and CO2 involved in that. So as that gas moves out from the generative source, it might migrate just through the power of that generation, or it might do it through power of that generation plus the effect of atmospheric pressure changes above. Okay. So we can get different things happening here as well. So we can get what's known as methane enrichment happening. So let's say we had a landfill gas, 60 40 split. If that gas then progresses to migrate through a, a wet ground that's undersaturated under in respect to CO2. What you will see or potentially see is that, that CO2 will get absorbed into the, into the groundwater. And effectively, when you're doing your monitoring further away, you'll get higher methane and lower CO2 that you would potentially be expecting. But remember, we do measure percentages and not buying mass. So essentially, we have the same methane, maybe even a little bit less. But because we've stripped the mass of the CO2 out, it looks like we've got more. Okay. And the reverse can be true as well, where we actually start with 
the same methane, but we end up with less. Okay, now again, depends what's going on the, on, on the soils here, but essentially this whole mechanism for this to happen is where we've got oxygen within the ground and microbes start to use the methane food source and combine with the oxygen to give, up, give us more CO2 and water in the process as well. So again, what looks what you know should be like gas when you're actually doing your volume measurements looks very different, but in reality, it's still like gas. So bear those in mind as well. Other areas we can use continuous monitoring include receptor monitoring. I think Richard mentioned this in his introduction. Um, this is quite a very useful tool when we're looking at sources, pathways, and receptor and conceptual model uh, pictures. If we have a receptor in place and we're worried about whether any hazardous gases are getting to there, you know, at, at the end of the day, if that receptor is there, it's always best to test, is, is kind of my view. Okay, let's see if that gas is actually getting there. We can do models, we can show that it may or may not be there, but in reality, the only way to be sure is to test. So again, here we've, we've brought in continuous monitoring gear. In this case, we're doing subfloor monitoring on the left, we're doing internal monitoring on the third, third picture, and then either side of that, we bolster that with, with surface sweeps with PPM and PPB instruments and some vapor samples as well. And another way we can look at source pathway receptor monitoring um, is called transect monitoring as well, is we can actually take some, some uh, contemporaneous data from the source, in this case, let's say for landfill. We can then take some, some data from the pathway. So we're looking at it towards a receptor. So we can actually see there is a little bit of methane coming through there. And then at the receptor in the subfloor, and here we're not seeing anything. And then if we allow our atmospheric pressure, uh, environmental correlation overlay, you can actually see the drive that's quite strong when you get this sustained and steep falling pressure is the only time we have seen. So again, collecting great evidence to supplement the development of our conceptual site and how then we are then going to manage the issues. So again, that's what it's all about, really, is, is the development of the conceptual site for your risk management purposes. I've shown you quite a few tools using continuous for those purposes. Okay, whatever sort of tiers of risk assessment you do. I know at GGS, we, we use the multiple lines of evidence approach uh, to our risk assessments as well. So basically, we want to take our chart that we started, the table we started off with at the beginning from the IPCC, move that, that sort of from the left of the table across as far as we can to the right, while keeping you know good value uh, costs for our clients too. Um, so let's have a quick look at boundary monitoring as well. So this might be where you've got a, a new landfill site that you want to work out baseline conditions and therefore some sort of strategy going forward for measuring for compliance. It might be an existing site that the client's got that they're worried about the liability assets from migration of, of hazardous gases. So here we take this site here. You can probably see the, uh, the cricket pitch in the top left. But essentially what we're looking at here is a landfill that's then got lots of houses to be built around it because that's what happens uh, a lot in the UK. Um, and we establish, first of all, CSM, you know, so we get our CSM, we go to test studies, and else build up a good picture. You might already have a lot of logs for the site. You know, you can build up some quite complex 3D models if you so choose. The next stage is to install a suitable monitoring network that you know is fit for purpose. Now, whether that includes a series of shallow wells, cluster wells, deeper wells, you decide based on that CSM. Okay. And then we go and do some initial monitoring. So it might be initially that you think that you can get enough information from periodic monitoring to build that picture. It might be that as a result of that, you actually feel that we need some continuous model to help understand what the, the sort of background is as well ahead of development. So you know that if you do change the regime on site, you're not making it worse for those receptors further out. Okay. And once we've got that information, we go to that CSM and update what we're doing and decide boundary extent. So in this case, uh, we've split this up into uh, several boundaries A, uh, A through G based on the conceptual site but principally in this case through what the receptor sensitivity is on the boundaries. And it might be then that we have to decide what the monitoring thresholds are for each of those boundaries. 
I'm going to take an example here. We've got some CO2 data, or some continuous data. It's actually everything, but we're going to look at CO2. Of, uh, could be, let's say, a, a new landfill that we, we want to see what's going on before we tip any waste. Well, actually, just in the natural background conditions here, we, we think we're getting CO2, you know, in the 9%, nine, nine, 10 mark. So we, we do that monitoring. We then clean and filter that data and actually determine if that's got a normal distribution or not and then standardize it. Okay. We then do this, some statistics on that data. And in, in this case, we, we tend to just use the Tmax, uh, but you might choose to use a, a different value um, in there, such as a, a percentile volume, it's up to you. Decide what, what you want to do and what's best for your particular circumstances. And then you, you decide what your actual background values are, your maximum background value is. In this case, we probably just take the T max. And then we consider that as we go forward we, against the CSM. And then pick response levels. And they could, you could have several different response levels, you know, from, a, from an initial sort of first tier um, is gone above the background to, you know, the second or third one where more and more management uh, actions get more urgent. Okay. Um, and then we go and do the monitoring. So from that, it, we might decide that of those boundaries, we're not too concerned about several of them and we'll just do those with periodic monitoring. We might decide over at B that it doesn't need to go up very infrequently, but we have decided through CSM in this case, that we do need continuous monitoring of two of those boundaries because we feel that the risk is, is warranted to, to do that. So it's about focusing um, the data. So how do we express that data? Well, a simple way is, and it's quite good to get across to, to clients who are non-specialist, is to use a brag rating. Okay, so red might be that it's gone way above a, maybe a secondary trigger or a response level that we do feel that that pollutant linkage exists and it's significant and we need to do something about it now. Amber might indicate that actually we are seeing some exceedances above our baseline um, and we need to look into that further, but it's not as urgent. So just more monitoring, just have a think, you know what's going on with CSM. And green might be that actually everything is still as we thought it was. So we continue with our strategy of monitoring. And then once we finalize that, we maybe get to the position, should get to the position where we're quite happy that the data has provided enough high quality data and therefore confidence that nothing's uh, of concern. And at that point, we maybe want to cease monitoring. At so what's coming next? Well, next generation continuous monitoring is happening, it's occurring. If you want to read more about it, um, we've, we've co-authored uh, the Claire Technical Bulletin 18. It's freely downloadable from the link on your screen. And that goes through a lot of the behavior that's already talked about today as well. So you can download that for free. And then the technology that we use at GDS here um, is the Gas Sentinel. So some of you may have heard of this, uh, but if you haven't, that's what one looks like. Um, we built it and we built it for the use by for specialists, by specialists. Is it's fairly light, it's very smart. If we need telemetry, it's got it. Um, in the UK, we do a lot of short-term deployments. So it's not necessarily required that often, but it's there. It's discreet, and we can lock it down, as you can see, with our uh, security headworks there in the top left, nice and wide. Um, we've got a range of different interchangeable sensors we can use with this. So we've got the expected series there uh, that we would see, but we've also got several others as well. We can just change them as we need them to. We've got the ability to do continuous dynamic and static flow measurements in one instrument and a fairly decent battery on that too. So we can tend to see four to six weeks of life on hourly monitoring out of that instrument. And of course, we can extend that with solar charging if need be. Um, fully enough in the UK, not that great, fully enough, but I suppose it could be quite good over in Victoria. So hopefully a, a nice introduction to uh, continuous monitoring and the various techniques you can apply. Um, thank you for listening and, and keep safe. Um, at this point now, I'll probably pass back to Richard. Are you ready? Okay. Thanks, John. There's no one. Well 
Uh, I've got a bit of a freeze on my screen. Um, quite sure why that has. Ah, oh, here we go. So, look, I think that was fantastic, John, to be honest, in terms of understanding the additional analysis that we can do on that data and really need to, to design monitoring programs to be most effective, both from a cost perspective and from an analysis of the, the actual risks. Um, in terms of this last part of the presentation, it's just to make you aware of what HydroTerra has to provide that continuous data. And I suppose, uh, based on John's presentation, be aware that we also have the resources to collect those other parameters, uh, those environmental parameters that John mentioned that um, uh, secondary influences, you know, such as tidal level and groundwater level, we can certainly rent you or provide you with telemetered uh, solutions for those as well. Uh, what do we have in our continuous uh, ground gas monitoring fleet at the moment? We have about 18, I think it is, uh, gas clams, which provide you with continuous data logging. But we do have a telemetry module that can be attached to that. But uh, there are battery change aspects to be aware of. So it depends on how long you want to deploy that for. We have a large number of Ambisense units, which do provide limited data. We have recently completed trials with a Plexus unit, which allows us to have many nodes around a landfill. And uh, it has sort of radio telemetry back to a central repository, which means the total cost of where you've got many uh, locations, or so, you know, let's say more than five, for example, becomes a very cost-effective way to collect uh, from multiple locations. It also has the ability to be customised for other VOCs, for example. And John mentioned the Gas Sentinel. Well, they're developing up their latest version of that, which is due for release in 12 months. And at that stage, that will become available through HydroTerra for use in Australia. Um, so I'll probably skip over this. So we've got some time for questions. And uh, at this stage, I will have a look at what we have in the question side of things. If I can find the question box. Okay. All right, we have four questions at the moment. First question is, hi, John, in your opinion, is there any value in undertaking leak testing of landfill gas bores? Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, is there? Um, I would imagine that the answer to that would be yes, and there's also a maybe not so much yes. Um, the reason I say that is, is that we can actually see or, you know, through continue, you can use continuous data and in fact spot monitoring data as well. Um, you'll be able to tell if you've got atmospheric ingress just by looking at the results. Okay, so if you take the ratio, just you use a simple ratio calculator, you take the sort of ratio of nitrogen in air, sorry, nitrogen in air to oxygen in air, ratio is four to one. Okay, so if you take your, your ground gas readings, um, and then once you calculate your balance that remains within uh, the borehole monitoring result, so let's say that was 20% that was left as a balance, we assume that's nitrogen. And let's assume that you had 5% oxygen left apart from your downhole reading, you divide 20 by 5, and if that comes out to 4, um, then that to me would indicate you've got a leaky well. Um, so that's potentially another way of, of looking at it or, or determining whether they're any good. Um, but you've also got to consider as well the, the stratigraphy around your monitoring well and whether there is an actual pathway just because of the permeability of the soil. So actually, would you expect to see air getting down there? Yeah, so if it's all sandy soils you, you, and the, the you know, response zone starts only a couple of metres there, you may well just have air in the ground anyway. So again, 
not a straightforward uh, answer, but it's again looking at the data, working out if you do have potential to make address, and then thinking about site specifics to see when you feel that there is a leak or it's not a well sealed. And again, we can do leak tests as well. So hopefully that, that helps. Answers that question. Thanks for that, John. Um, next question. Uh, what are the differences between the flow rate measurement between a gas flux and the GA5000? I often find the flow rates recorded with a gas flux are much higher than with a GA5000, even after numerous spot monitoring events. Is this simply due to the ability to capture more data over a longer period of time? Well, that's a really good uh, question. We see mm. that a lot. So. Uh, Good luck with that one, John. <laughs> okay, well, funnily enough, um, I do know um, what we're talking about. Well, we, we, we see it, we see it too with instruments that we use. Um, I don't have any experience with gas flux, so I can't answer it on, on its behalf. Um, but I do know that with different instruments, they do tend to use different technologies for measuring flow. So it depends what technology it is that you're using and it might have specific requirements for doing that. For instance, we have an instrument over here that, that we, you have to tell it what the gas concentrations are first to get an accurate flow because of the, the different densities of the gas. Um, whereas, for instance, the GA5000, I think it's an orifice plate, which just uses a pressure differential um, across, across the orifice to give you flow. So they will vary. Um, with ours, uh, we, we, and it also depends particularly what, what gases they've been calibrated against. So most of them, if not all of them, will tend to be done with air. And if your gases that you're recording are not air and very different in terms of density or buoyancy or temperature, then that can change the results too as well. So you can also do this, there's also a temperature flow, which you potentially think maybe gas exclusions. Um, again, so the answer is, is complicated and, and complex, but it, it's a whole number of factors. But the key one behind it, I think, is the, is the monitoring uh, sense of it to do it in a lot of cases. Is that right? Did that answer the question? Thanks, John. It's a little bit hard to hear you sometimes. I'm not sure if you're leaning back from the microphone every now and again, but um, just letting you know. Uh, the next question, how big a diameter monument do you need for the gas sentinel? Is that like the headworks, the monument? Correct, yeah. Um, it's fairly small. So we tend to use something with a, um, an eight inch headworks. What's that, two, 200 mil, something like that diameter. Um, and we probably need about, uh, 300 millimeters uh, in height. So yeah, fa fairly small, really. I mean, obviously, but a bigger one, all the better. We get you know much better handles. Get your hands down the sides. We we can get it in eight inch uh, headworks or monument. Okay, the next one you should know pretty easily. Does the gas sentinel measure bore flow rate? It does indeed. Excellent answer. <laughs> um, are there any applications for this technology in monitoring uh, beneath parks and forests? It's an interesting question. I wonder what, what the sort of risk driver is for those. I, I know in, in uh, certainly in the UK, in parks, it's very common because most of them are landfills or closed landfills. Um, I don't know what it might be down in Victoria. Um, I suppose in, there is often uh, incidences where vegetation dies because the root zone is um, saturated with the gases yeah. and the, uh, there's no oxygen for the roots, right? Yeah. That would, that would be so, another. Yeah, I um, suppose not all gas comes from landfills, but it's, yeah, if you start to see vegetation die back, such and so forth, Typically, you're quite right, Richard, that's to do with generally oxygen starvation of the roots or um, 
if it's not actual contaminated soils themselves. So yeah, good to use that. We've got one last question before time runs out. Came in at 10.30. Uh, should the standing water level in the landfill gas monitoring bores be measured during every monitoring event? If water is present, in what circumstances is this a significant issue? Mm -hmm. um, I, well, the, the answer to, to that one is yes, um, you should. Well, we, as standard, we record water level dips um, every time we're out there. Um, we also do the base dips as well, so we can understand that that, that monitoring well is silting up or not. Um, also quite useful if, if you accidentally write down the wrong number as you, you know, when you're doing 50 of these things, and then you need to double check with the logs that you have got the right one. So, so yes, I would monitor it as well. Um, what are the circumstances this can be significant? Um, several ways, really. If you've got um, water in your well that goes above your response zone, then you've essentially got a sealed system in there. So you're not no longer monitoring the sort of gases that are passing through the, the sort of unsaturated zone and the vado zone. All you're going to measure there is the headspace that, and, and effectively what gases are coming out of the groundwater. So that's interesting to look at. Another one with, with water is let's say we get a heavy period of rainfall and water level rises in the ground. And as that rises up, and let's say it does go above um, the, um, or the puts pressure in the, in the monitoring well, if that goes above the response zone, it certainly will. You end up with a quite a substantial pressure building up in that headspace. And if you did your monitoring then, at that time you open that valve, you would get really, really high flow. It's probably off the scale of your instruments. Um, but you would see that, you know, if you left that open, it wouldn't take too long, maybe a minute or two for that to, or even shorter, for that to die down to nothing. And um, we call that the piston. So yes, um, I suppose a few key areas there to, to watch out for with water. Thanks very much, John. Uh, just to finish up, um, Great questions, by the way. Thanks for all of those. A um, couple of things that we've noticed um, over the years is uh, soil moisture certainly plays its part in affecting these continuous readings as well. Uh, so I guess just to sum up on what I've uh, heard from John is that there are several factors that affect these measurements. Uh, some are spatial, some are temporal, some relate to how these things are installed. And uh, it's also important to keep in mind the receptors uh, in terms of confirming the risks that uh, the models are telling us may exist. Um, probably the big take home for me was the, the rigor of analysis with statistics to look at correlations between environmental conditions and our ground gas readings. I think uh, that is very important. What HydroTerra is doing with DataStream, which is our data hosting platform, is developing these analytical approaches to allow you to plot those things against each other in real time, which uh, I think will help support uh, the consultants making the management decisions on what to do about these things. But uh, John, many thanks for today and uh, many thanks to all the attendees. It's been a great turnout for this session, obviously something that's of interest to a lot of people. And uh, that's it from HydroTerra for the day. Thanks very much. If you want to get in touch with John, just flick us an email to HydroTerra. We can facilitate introductions. If uh, if you're after continuous ground gas data, give us a call and we can assist you with that as well. All right, many thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.